boy in real life. No, 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 no. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> <we're> taking, <laughs> this move we're taking from online and yeah. made real races. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so I'm, 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 I'm an online champion without knowing how to play game in real life. Yeah. So there was a footage that you just made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were not, I mean, real life uh, Formula One drivers. Exactly. Right. So, but they were very good online, online races. And then he took them, trained them. Trained them in yes. real life. In real life. Yes. Not in the game. Yeah. In and, real life. Yes. And we are in and they and we are talking about game. Yeah, exactly. So if you're gonna beat me now, mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to be trained to beat you. I could actually beat you online. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. And get trained, come back to real life and beat you. Okay. <laughs> All right. <then. laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> hello guys. Uh, welcome to the second episode of Time with Julius. And um, so I'll tell you before I introduce my uh, my guest today. Um, so when we were actually um, planning to start this podcast, um, me and my PA. So my PA mentioned this person that, oh boss, um, let's interview this person. It's actually because we're looking at um, people that her stories, people that I don't know are gonna inspire people because that's this that's all this um journey is about. And he mentioned, you know, this person and then um first time and then he mentioned you again and then you mentioned you again. I'm like, okay, why not? Why well, I mean let's let's try it. And I went to see this person, I went to the shop and um I was impressed, you know, with his works and everything. And um so I was like, okay, so I don't, I, I don't remember if we actually gave you the letter the first time we saw you or we came back and gave you the letter. Yeah. I think I was called on phone and then yeah. the letter followed as you guys came. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. So he called you on the phone and then we dropped the letter for you. But when I went to your shop, when I came to your shop, I was so, so much impressed. And mm -hmm. when it works and I spoke to you and the first time I spoke to you, you were like, Yes, I will come on it because you also um, wanted to share your story, you know, your journey and also inspire people. And um, you may right. understand that that's all this about us, all that you are about as well. Um, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome um, to Kree Baba. I actually, um, you know what, I get messed up with your name. Yeah. Okay. I know your real name is Godwin. Yes. Right. And you Degree Baba and Reflect. So what's what's the you know is, is it two different brands? No. Okay, so um, this is basically <clears throat> reflect is basically like a a whole business, a whole corporate entity that the Greek Baba works in. So for instance, like you know this thing about barbers where you have um, barbers having barbers to end their name. So let's say Julius. Supposing that you're a barber, yeah. We'll see with Julius the Baba. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So my personal brand name is Degree Baba. Yeah. And Reflect yeah. as a whole business entity on its own that does so many things. So Degree Baba works at Reflect. Oh. All to all to like um batteries. Yeah. That business principle that um the business has to be a going concern. Like it has to survive. And not be tied on the neck on of one individual. So okay. when degree baba is not dead, reflect exists. So the reflect is kind of like the mother company for all of it. And what other things that's you know what other things do you do you know after like reflect reflect? So. Okay, so reflect is supposed to be um, it's supposed because <clears throat> we are can currently taking baby steps. Yeah. So it started with um, barbering. Yeah. Right. And now it is growing. Now we are able to teach. So it's supposed to be like a unisex salon. Uh -huh. That's the whole business idea. Okay. But I started with barbering because we back in school, I was um, barbering to survive, you know. Huh. Then after school, I mean, it transformed into a business that could actually feed me and help others. Yeah. So Reflect is about um, a unisex salon. And now we are trying to form an academy, okay. Reflect Barbering School where we teach other people to become barbers. And then Reflex has a lot of dreams. Like, I mean, we could have a a time where we'll come, we'll, we'll have like a Reflex um, boutique, Reflex um, gym center. Like it's a brand that anything can be. 
than around it. And always people come around and ask me, ah, why does your salon look different? Because mostly you have people say, ah, oh, it should be like a reflect barbering salon. But that would be like a limitation to what the business um, had envisioned to be. Yeah. Because it's supposed to be an umbrella brand that covers so many things. Okay. So maybe one of these days you start seeing reflect um, fashion stuff like clothes, yeah. sneakers, yeah. branded reflect stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that reflect supposed to do. All right. Okay. All right. I understand now. Mm -hmm. So um, so how long ago have we been doing this? How long? I mean, I mean, roughly have we been doing this? Okay. Um, officially as a, a business, a registered business, it's been like, um, let me say six years. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right after university. Mm -hmm. But personally on the journey, the whole story behind Reflex started, let me say like 13 years ago, 13 years ago in high school. Yeah. That was when I realized that part of me that could actually cut hair and it was out of some struggles, you know, the yeah. society decided to put you in a corner where you need to be able to identify yourself yeah. and survive, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it was like a means of survival until yeah. university days now, it moved from just feeding me, helping my friends. Yeah. And, you know, we live in a country where it's very difficult to, I mean, have a decent and a well-paid job if somebody, you don't have anybody to hold you. Yeah. Anybody to say, oh, go and see this guy. I mean, Godwin is coming. Please, he needs a job. Give him a job. If you don't have anybody to lead you on, yeah, you have to fight for yourself. Yeah. So basically, I was just fighting for myself, and by God's grace, yeah, it's not only really helping me now; it's helping a lot of people. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure you've got. I mean, uh, you've got some sort of passion, for, even though it started as um as a survivor thing for you, and but obviously you got a passion for it. Um, and that's what I want to find out is. When did it become business, you know? When did you realize, actually, I need to take this thing seriously, you know? I need to take it to the next level because your style, you know, um, your brand is is a whole lot. I mean, I, I can't talk about it, you know, for the, for the whole day, yeah. you know? So when did you actually realize that, actually, I need, I mean, I, mean, I need to make this thing seriously, you know? Okay, so... Then again, that's where I spoke about where it went away from feeding just me to me being able to save. You know, to be able to save, you need to be able to take care of your basic needs and expenses. Yeah. If you're not able to take off all those things, there's no way you can save. Mm -hmm. So like savings is actually interest, um, how do you call it? your income minus mm -hmm. your expenses. That's what gives you savings in economics, right? Mm -hmm. So the moment I started having overflow, I realized that no, <clears throat> something good could come from come out from it. And the best part was my days in the university when we were studying entrepreneurship and innovations, right? Okay. There was a time where the lecturer spoke about entrepreneurship and innovations being like your ability to, I mean, create something different. Innovations being like creating something different or picking something that already exists mm -hmm. and modifying it yeah. to look different. So I was like, ah, this, this is me. I'm going through university. I'm having hard times from university, uh, from class, right? I go, to, I go into the barber shop, get haircut. Sometimes I go to a crowd, get sneakers and come in. So I realize, ah, if I'm a barber and I'm in school, okay, where I find myself, not so many people would want to attain higher education and still want to be a barber. Like, excuse me to say, it is believed by the masses that the left the job is left for I mean the dropout, the less yeah. privileged and all that. So yeah. when you see our society and how it moves with regards to the barbering industry, not so much importance is, is attached to it. Then I realized the niche. I was like, okay, fine. Let's change the narrative about it. Because even whilst in whilst in school, I had a lot of stigmatization when it comes to me being a student and barbering. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, you see a nice girl on campus, yeah. you want to talk to her and then, I mean, get acquainted, become friends and all that. But in the moment, because I was so loud on campus, yeah, I was because anywhere I go, I want to talk about myself. So, like, 
they, they don't want to mingle with, I mean, a student baba. Like, they see, like, you are really struggling in life. Like, yeah. what can you offer? What do you have to offer? Yeah. Especially where I come from. Maybe somewhere else in the world is different. Yeah. So that was when I realized that I needed to change the narrative about it. First, it came out of the desire to change the narrative, the desire to prove people who look down upon what had survived me throughout my life and education, prove them wrong by making a fortune out of it. Yeah. So that was where everything changed. Then I spoke to two of my classmates. We drew a business plan and we started working towards it bit after bit. So Reflect actually started um, as a virtual firm. We didn't have a brick and mortar store where you entered the last time. No. Yeah. It was just an online. So I had this my backpack. Mm -hmm. I'll move from house to house, giving her cats and all that. Oh, that's how you started? Yeah, basically. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite interesting. Because, I mean, talking about narrative, because um, I know a lot of people that are doing well in the Bible industry, you know, from, I mean, where I'm from. I don't know much about Ghana, you know, um, but I don't see much about the Babes, you know, talking and, you know, give, getting platforms, you know, obviously. Um, also um, inspiring, you know, the, 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 the young people and the youth and, you know. Um, so I understand how much people can make, you know, from Barbara. Okay. So, I mean, I was, when I spoke to you before and then when my, I mean, my peers spoke to me, spoke to me about you, I was like, yes, I mean, let's do this, you know, let me, let's talk about this, let's, um, let, let's get into detail about, you know, your work. Okay. So, um, I understand. And obvious, where do you think that narrative is coming from? The narrative about... About Baba is not doing well. Not doing well. Yeah. Okay. I, I think as um, the level of importance, the Baba is themselves yeah. attached to the job. Okay. So you can have like a Baba oh. who does not even believe in the work they are doing. One out of ten, right? Uh, ten out of ten, right? Yeah. I've had like um, seven people. Mm -hmm. Let's see, um, seven out of barbers that I've spoken to, mm -hmm. seven out of ten barbers that I've spoken to, would actually tell you that oh, they are doing barbering for the interim, hoping that they get a better job. So, for instance, you have gold, and you do not even know that this is gold. How would somebody who visits you and sees that gold? depending on how you treat the gold in your house. Maybe you leave it lying on the floor somewhere yeah. else. You don't yeah. keep it well. Yeah. The person is not going to attach any value to the gold. Yeah. Right? So it starts with the babes, mm -hmm. the mindset, and how we preach it. But in my story, it's different. I was going through school, cutting the after school. Many expected me to become, let's say, a bank manager, Something else. Yeah. Right? You yeah. have a white collar job. Yeah. But I've actually had job proposals, like where I even did my service. I, I had the opportunity to be within, but then I did that for Barbara. Yeah. So that was when the narrative started changing. People are starting to talk about it. Ah, why would you waste all these years in school to become a Baba? And I didn't understand that statement. I wanted to prove that statement wrong. Yeah. Because now I'm able to make so much money that, let's say, a nine to five job wouldn't give me. Oh. You get it? Yeah. And I keep on adding on to the value that I've already have in had in class. Mm -hmm. Kept on kept on polishing the barbering work. Yeah. With videos, with branding, trying to look exceptional. Yeah. And now so much importance has been added to the barbering. Yeah. One of the days you barely see a barber on the TV talk show, like a morning breakfast show, being spoken about for like a 30 minutes. Yeah. But I came into the game and changed the narrative about it. Now, TV stations want to talk to these people, create, get content from them, get to understand how their industry Yeah, It's like a light being thrown on. So it's basically about how Babes themselves him sees themselves. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, talking about, I'll come back to the branding, you know, because I want to know, I know you do your things very different, you know, as compared to the, the other, you know, Babes that I've seen. Um, so how, when you, when you made that decision to go into the Barbarian industry, were your family disappointed in you somehow? Yeah. Yes. My, my dad, my dad actually didn't agree with me. Yeah. He, because he feels that, um, 
I mean, if you want to be a Baba, why didn't you tell me earlier? Mm-hmm. And wait all because yeah. I could have taken you to let's say a corner store, Baba, to train you how to cut hair and yeah. makeup. Yeah. But the truth is that I always had this to say: like education is not an end to itself. Right? Many people think when you go to school, make the good grades, and you're out of school, you graduate with the first class, it means there is money on your table. Mm. I saw education just to post what my father was thinking about it as a tool. Yeah. Just like I use my clippers to carry. I saw it as a tool to, I mean, realize my dreams. Yeah. All right. So I use education as a tool to polish barbering and make it more attractive yeah so even though my dad was disappointed in me i saw it differently Mm -hmm. and you know generations keeps coming and goes right what my father would have been seeing years back in the 90s that was that was the real way to success yeah but even that i don't even agree because most of the rich people we see today the big names we hear today they are serial business moguls entrepreneurs who invested into businesses yeah you don't hear them working for anybody mm-hmm. little do i see those names for papa you mentioned let's say the, the first five word billionaires yeah. people are actually working for them yeah so it's about your ability to create a business from something yeah so i saw the space and went into it and created it so basically my dad wasn't in line but today yeah. i think he's seen the clearer picture you know the vision is always just you yeah you understand? Yeah. Until you make it clearer from the start, it's become it, it's so blurry. Yeah. Until you make it very visible for everybody to see. Now they oh yeah. It's like you always have to take that step. That's right. You know? Yeah, I always have to take that step for people to realize actually, yeah, this guy is serious. Now it makes sense. They have they want to see something. That's true. You know, because I mean, if you wait, no one is coming to encourage you to do whatever. You know, so you have to take it upon yourself to you know, um, made that decision. And that will lead to my next question about decision making. Good. You know, um, decision making is one thing when we're implementing it is another thing. Yeah. How long did it take you to make that decision that, okay, this is what I want. This is what I'm, I don't care whatever people are going to say, I'm going for it. Did it take you a while or you just woke up one day and then feel like that's it, I'm doing it. And how much how much were you thinking you know like how long did you take did it take you to make that decision you know and how long did it take you to implement it okay so um here's one thing about decision for me you know mine didn't um happen like okay fine i'm out of school yeah i need to make a decision on what to do mm-hmm. My decision making was a whole process. It was a journey. Yeah. I think it was a destined path God has paved for me to walk through. You know, sometimes eh, you may be going through so many things, so many bad things today, so many things that will be affecting you personally, physically, emotionally, and psychologically, right? Mm. But I can tell you that when you look into it, it's actually a preparation for you for the but bigger battle ahead of you mm. because I was having serious financial difficulties. I come from a home where education is like a queue. Okay. We go intense. Mm-hmm. No matter how good you are, no matter how good your results are, I mean, whoever is ahead of you has to go to school before you. And so where was that? Was it because of financial? Financial difficulties, right? Yeah. But I was that child out of the five children who always want to break the odds. Yeah. So if... The line is, A has to go to school before B. Okay. B can't wait for A. B has to do something to change that narrative. Yeah. So it was me surviving, surviving, surviving. So the decision part was when I realized that, okay, even in school, let me tell you a story. Okay. When I went to high school, yeah. my dad used to give me 15 CDs, like a term or something, right? Mm-hmm. I, was having, I was having serious hard times. But... I was doing haircuts for, for uh, let's say, 50 pesos, sometimes in exchange for butter trade, food, and all that, because I didn't have enough provisions to live on. But then I was that guy, if I don't tell you this is what is happening in the background, you don't know. Yeah. Right? So I did that, made some money, 
saved that money, came to Accra, bought phones, and started retailing it on campus. You get it? Right. Yeah. So it's about financial discipline. Yeah. Um, how do you call it? Saving mm-hmm. for the next move. Mm-hmm. You get it? So I went through all that. Then I realized that, okay, this thing that I said I'm doing to survive, mm-hmm. it is going beyond survival. Yeah. I'm having overflow. Mm-hmm. Now I can take five of, five of my friends to the cafeteria, spread them, they'll mm-hmm. come back and I feel okay. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. So, so that was when I came to a realization that, okay, fine. Even when I was doing my national service, uh-huh. you go to work at 4 a.m. Work starts at 8, but you have to meet the bus at 4 a.m. 4 a.m., you join the bus at Atomic, take you straight to through the Tamamoto Way, Taman Port and Harbour, every day in and out. And I spent 9 to 5 every day for almost like 25 days. And at the end of the day, you get seven, uh, five, 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 nine. Right. Throughout that time, I realized that no, I could go and do one home service and make like a 300 cities just in some few hours. Yeah. So that was when I realized that no, this is actually the way to go. Yeah. So the decision, the decision actually came from when Barbrain moved from surviving uh, me in life into what? Me earning more than. Just a means of survival. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, my next question would be um, how much, I mean, decision making is one thing and implementing is implementing it is another thing. How, how much thinking goes into your decision making and how long does it take you to make your decision? Okay. So um, when it comes to thinking about my decisions, right? I'm that person who likes to consult people a lot. Yeah. And so if I have a plan, a business idea that I want to realize, right, I mostly like to speak to my circle of friends because they are the only resource we have. Yeah. Um, sometimes also try to talk to the experts, people in the field. Okay. So for example, let's say um, I'm looking into starting the, like a, a mobile phone business, right? Yeah. I would like to look for somebody in the industry yeah. and learn from the person. Yeah. Okay. So I have like a circle of friends that I actually talk to. And also when it comes to my barbering uh, stuff, how I started it, yeah. I had a team, mm-hmm. a group of friends from class who were very brilliant. So we had to draw up the plan, eliminate redundancies, things that are not really necessary, take them out. It goes through like a serious process of scrutiny. Like making sure that everything works out. Okay. Right. And um, so that will lead to my next question. That was the best decision you've ever made. Mm. The best decision I've ever made was maybe moving out of uh, my way, like nine to five. Yeah. And focusing on my skill. Yeah. Barbering. Yeah. Because it didn't really, I mean, save me, but now it is touching on their lives. Yeah. And inspiring so many people. Yeah. And obviously making decisions, uh, obviously, I mean, your decision making, I realize that branding is power, like is, is part of your decision making and you take your branded very, very seriously, you know. So when also did you realize, actually, I need to brand myself because traditional barbers won't do that. They won't brand it, so they just, you know, wait for people. But obviously branding is also means actually going out to um, sell your self or your product to people. So at what point did you realize, actually, let me start branding myself. Let me, I mean, um, go on social media. Let me go on um, interviews, you know. Um, let, so what, whatever things that you do to brand yourself, when did you realize I need to, you need to do that? You know, one way or the other, we all do some form of branding. Maybe let's say you have like a particular hairstyle for like maybe five years. Mm-hmm. When you come out, this is how people see you, see you to look. That is branding. You basically painting yourself in a particular way. And branding requires consistency. Always hitting on them. They'll let people know that this is what I look like. So branding actually started for me, even from the name, Degree Baba. Right? Mm-hmm. So your name, your logo, your colors, 
the way you talk, your communications, and all that. Those are your branding elements. Those are the elements that makes you look different. You know, in every industry, there is competition. Yeah. And the only thing that makes you stand out is how you look. Yeah. Which is the coat you wear, what covers you. And it's only branding that probably would differentiate, um, let's say, a degree baba from any other baba. Yeah. Because basically what we do is we all do what? Barbara. Yeah. But why would the people ever say I'm different? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is the Baba that has gone through all the stages in education in a society where they feel like bad brain is left onto dropouts. Mm-hmm. So like you are changing the narrative. Okay. And when you look different, right? People start to talk about you. Oh. For example, let's assume we go to the mall. We are walking through the mall and all of a sudden you see somebody walking with his head. Mm. You draw attention. People start asking the questions. Why is this guy walking with his head? Yeah. And everybody walks with two legs, but he's walking with his head. Yeah. You are looking different. And trust me, the very first time I went viral on the social media was because he says he's a baba with a degree. Right. The society don't understand. Yeah. TV stations started calling. Mm-hmm. Bloggers started posting. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And it opened up a very wide conversation on social media. That was when I had the portal to enter into the media space. Yeah. Now, there's one thing to get to the top, but maintaining at the top is consistency. Yeah. So when you enter the shop, you realize that there is a logo on the wall. If you pay attention, like white, black, and gold. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I realized that. The way we talk, there is some kind of vibe. When you enter the shop and you realize you enter there, you see the vibe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The environment where everybody wants to, I mean, have some good vibe. Yeah. And that is in a way branding yourself as well. Yeah. Because the experience you even give people yeah. contributes to what you. Yeah. So you, okay. <laughs> you finished secondary school and then, but the time you finished secondary school, you were, you were cut, you were cut hair, right? Yeah. And then you went to uni. As, so one of your interviews in which, you know, you were talking about how you enrolled yourself in, in TNA. When you went to uni, did you know that you were still going to do, like, you're still going to cut hair? Or you went to uni thinking, actually, I, I'm going to uni to get something better for myself, you know, to, you know, do so- something different. Or you knew that regardless of your degree, you're still going to maintain that, you know, um, skill set. Okay, so I had very bigger dreams. I never knew I was going to be a baba. Okay. I went to uni because it was a norm yeah. for you to go to school. Yeah. So I was only following the procedure. Yeah. But a good thing was that I was very fortunate to have chosen the right course, mm-hmm. which I was actually living in real life. So I go to class. Yeah. I learn stuff about business and I go out of the class, come on the streets, and practice business. So I'm, I'm, I'm always ahead of my mates in class because whatever they teach in class, I live it in real life. So I went to uni with Barbrain as a means of survival through the university. So I knew I was going to make money from Barbrain and invest it into my education. Yeah. So then again, the decision came about when I started having overflow. You get it? Yeah. So there's, there, there was no point where I was going to school to become a baba. No. Yeah. I was going to school because I had to go to school. Yeah. And learn business. Yeah. But then, university, UPSC taught us how to actually um, create businesses. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. It's a scholarship with professionalism. What is the profession? So I had the tool of what? Barbrain. Use your class knowledge to turn Barbrain into an empire, into a business. That's basically yeah. what happened. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, initially it was just for you to survive. You're exactly. doing that for you to survive. Exactly. And then you realize, actually, I can make something out of this. And then you start investing into it. You start branding yourself. Now, people will be people that are watching or maybe want to, you know, get into your field as well. They may be asking, 
because branding, investing into into yourself or into your business and branding is a is a lot of money. Yeah, you know, you need to um have enough to invest yourself because I'm sure people out there that are doing the same work as you won't be like you. There's a lot of people that wanna you know be like you that you inspire, but they haven't got the funding. So it's easy for people to say, oh, they, they might even think they might even think you're doing something dodgy to get your money, to invest into your business. You know, what what would you tell them? Because clearly a lot of people are struggling in that industry, in the vibrant industry, and you are doing very well. What are you doing different? Okay, so um that's the point where I don't um let me say I don't really agree with you because mm-hmm. you don't need so much to look like what I look because I didn't come from so much. Right. I came from small. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we have bigger dreams. Yeah. But it is your ability to break those dreams into pieces and start working towards them step by step. And you know, how do people do that? Okay. So the problem is that we always want to cut corners. Right. We always want to look big at once. Mm-hmm. And my ex- little experience I've had in business taught me that even business, eh, right? When you have all the money to invest into it, you don't just start and look big. You need a system. You need to go through the processes of, let's say, moving, moving from one barber chair, moving from selling one sneaker to yeah. selling like a box of clip, uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, sneakers. Right? Yeah. So I started as a freelance Baba. Baba that moves from house to house. What did I do with my money? I didn't go to the club. Yeah. Okay. What did I do with my money? I didn't buy expensive cl- uh, uh, sneakers with my, 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 my money. Yeah. What did I do with my money? I saved my money and reinvested into something else that would be making me money whilst I'm giving haircuts. Like sale of sneakers, phones. They are easy things like we said. So your ability to identify opportunities to create a pool of funding to invest into your bigger picture, which is what what you want to reflect to be. Yeah. And we don't believe in one city, two city, three city, four city, five cities to make ten thousand Ghana cities. Mm-hmm. We believe in boom, ten thousand yeah. Ghana cities. Yeah. 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 So people So that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. People are not patient yeah. enough to save. Yeah. People are not patient enough to go through the hassle of working so hard to make small. Yeah. And people are not financial prudent. Yeah. Financially disciplined. Yeah. You right? Yeah. In everything you do, right? You need to make a sacrifice. If you want to pass your examination, right? Mm-hmm. You need to sacrifice your sleep. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you want 10,000 cities, right? You need to sacrifice maybe the flashy life that, life that you, you you expect to live for that short period of time mm-hmm. to get that you're thinking. Discipline. Exactly. So you need to be disciplined to be able to what? Achieve these goals. Yeah. Hmm. I'm actually learning a lot from this, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I'm very glad you came today. Um. So then my next question will be... um. What are some of the biggest challenges you face as a barber and how do you address them? So, as for barber brain, when it comes to the profession, yeah. you know, um, no one has become an expert in one day. Yeah. You have to go through the process. Yeah. So, sometimes there are challenges. Maybe with a job, there are some customers who are frustrated before the email sits in your chair. And you know, sometimes you're not in a good mood. Yeah. You still want to, I mean, save customers. You, the haircut sometimes goes wrong. Yeah. But what do you do? Because we are not perfect. Mm-hmm. You get it? And sometimes managing other babies becomes the bigger problem. Right. It's very difficult to manage people. Mm-hmm. People are not machines where you set them into a particular mood and expect them to work. Like even machines sometimes break down. Yeah. So people always disappoint you. And all that, but I mean, the whole essence of entrepreneurship is your ability to keep solving problems, yeah, day in day out. So there are challenges. Like sometimes customers are not satisfied. Sometimes employees fail you. Sometimes there is money. Even sometimes government. Sometimes tax. 
So could you give us some of the examples, like the challenges that you face, you know, throughout your career? Obviously, there's going to be more challenges going to come your way because mm-hmm. you keep coming up. It's going to be difficult every day. Every decision you make, every step you make is going to be very difficult for you, mm-hmm. you know. So what are some of the challenges that you've already faced and how how do you overcome them? Because it's not easy. It's true. Okay, so the challenge that really hit me hard was um, issue with people I work with. Yeah. Right? So there was a time where I brought this guy in. It was a Nigerian. He came all the way from Nigeria, settled in a shy man. No, he didn't come to me from Nigeria. He came, oh, right. s- settled in a shy man. Okay, okay. Then he had his back and forth over there. Then a friend connected him to me. Mm-hmm. He was a dreadlocks guy. He came in. So I actually had to, I mean, tame him, take him through all the process. And you know, you are investing in your energy into this person to make sure that, oh, you have a vision you want to share with them. Then all of a sudden, one day, they wake up and they don't show up again. Forgetting about all the invest. So, like, people will always shock you. And I was hit so hard because it was my first experience. I never had it before. You were disappointed. Disappointed. Yeah. Then I get to a time where everybody goes away and it's left with just you. Oh, wow. Yes. It gets to that. It gets to the point where you feel like quitting. Mm. But when I think about quitting, yeah, I think about, I also think about people who used to tell me that ah, it wasn't going to work. How can you leave your whole job and say you want to be a baba? After all these years of struggle, after all these sleepless nights of learning, yeah, achieve your degree, you want to do this. So there has actually been problems, the serious challenges that will make you feel like you should. And when, when I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it, it happens with, I mean, to everyone, when you feel like giving up, but what makes you come back to your feet? Your goal. I mean, you're looking for a yes. Okay. You don't get the yes, you keep going. Do you always need someone to speak to you, to remind you, to push you, or you have to push yourself? So, personally, okay, I've been through a lot. Yeah. And I've had times where I feel like getting to a point E and I'm not able to get there. Yeah. And I still push to get to, like, it's self-motivation. Yeah. Always, I know that in the quest to get what I want, there are going to be problems. I've come to understand that is a natural phenomenon that happens. Okay. Every day you meet problems in achieving your goals. Mm. So even if you don't get it, find a way. Yeah. So the spirit of not giving up is what keeps me going. How far you've gone with kind hair in your life in terms of, you know, meeting people and investing into other things? Mm. You know, one thing about Barron is that it is centered around people. So definitely you meet all walks of people from doctors to musicians to, I mean, normal everyday life people. Yeah. You meet soldiers, you meet policemen, what have you, you know, and it gives you the opportunity to, I mean, I mean, meet people that on a normal day you would have actually paid or booked an appointment to meet, but they rather book appointments to meet you. Yeah. So for somebody like, uh, I always mention it, his name always comes first when he, when somebody asked me how far I've been with Barbara, because I've been watching him when I was very young, yeah. listening to him on radio at the time, Bernard, Bernard I've loved City. Okay. That man is just so humble, like humble, respectful. I've also had the opportunity to do, I think, can promise his hair sometime when I was working oh, so really? at his labor. Yeah. I also did. Uh, you did Kim Promise's hair? Yeah. Kim Promise's hair? Kim Promise's hair sometime. Kim Promise's hair, yeah. Um, you go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> let's go ahead. Oh, really? Okay. He, he, oh. Just, as, as, he just makes sure that it's always off, so the whole world doesn't feel like oh, he has hair. Oh, but let's go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, be I, I guess it was an easy job, no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, you know, actually, bald hair is not an easy, easy job like that. Oh, really? You have to make sure you scrape all the hair without cutting someone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's very risky. All right, keep promise. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be rude, but I mean, I just had to um, uh, make sure. <laughs> I also did. I also did few few ODG sometimes. Yeah. Then I had some a few politicians, and because politicians are mostly very, 
discreet and all that. They don't like their names. So I wouldn't be able to mention names. No, I've fine. done some yeah. politicians before. I've done uh, Kweku Smoke before. I've done um, Feli Luna. I've done um, yeah. Kiki Mali. I've done uh, Wendy Shea. Oh. I've done Bullets before. Okay. Uh, the list continues. Some, yeah. some other representatives and all that. Like, I mean, it's been a Jennifer. But basically, I see everybody who sits in my chair as a celebrity. And, yeah. you know, there's one thing about all these people that I mean, are in the public limelight and all that. One thing with respect when it comes to Obabes is, I mean, very, very difficult. Yeah. So, um, I don't, I don't tend to value them over maybe somebody who comes in every day yeah. to get a haircut. So everybody who sits in my chair is a celebrity because the fact that you go and come back, sit in my chair, yeah, alone makes you a celebrity because you feed me. Yeah, and you know there are some of these top people, right? Out of my experience, they feel you are too less. So sometimes the the, the, the amount of respect they are supposed to give you, you don't get it. Yeah. And for someone like me, I entered into the barbering industry to change the narrative and the perception people have about barbers. Yeah. So for someone like me who comes to your house, respect you so much show up on a on, on, on a very good appointment time, a great time, and I come and you disrespect me, I'll go and never return again because I feel like you are not my target. Yeah. Whatever I do, that respect is never going to come. Oh. So I have to leave you, keep doing pro. Well. Yeah. So one day you see me somewhere, or one day somebody is going to recommend me to you. Like, oh, I've been with this guy before. Then there and there you have to realize that, no, it was because of ABC, I've, I've not been able to work with this guy again and it's gone. Then the perception then changes totally. Yeah. And Bernard is different. That man, he's my world best celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. And has there ever been a time where you finish work, you get back home and you have your shower, you lie in the bed and feel so happy and, you know, motivated because you've put a smile on people's faces because Everyone comes to you, you know, um, to look good, you know, and it's it's it's, it's a kind of um, delicate job because they're sensitive because you can't go wrong, you know, at one time, at any point, you know, of your life. I mean, I, I'm sure it happens, you know, there's times that they, you know, there could be mistakes and everything. But as it as they ever be a, a time where you go back home and then you feel so good. Because you've you've realized you've done a good job, you put smiles on the people's faces. <laughs> you know what I'm laughing because yeah, I, I get it every day. Yeah. Every day. And sometimes I don't even have to go home to feel that way. Yeah. After every haircut, you have that feeling. Yeah. You know, our job comes with so much joy. So much joy and excitement. Because imagine it this way. You are in the barber shop. Somebody walks in looking all messed up. And when you have a, a bad, like, hair day, like you're feeling so rough, you are feeling so scruffy and all that, you want to look good, right? It affects your whole being, your confidence, yeah, right? Your looks, yeah, your emotions, everything. It affects you totally because you feel like you look different. Yeah. So picture it through the time you sit in the barber chair, and for someone like me, the moment you sit in my chair, I start to ask you about how your day went. Yeah. It's a whole experience. Yeah. How you did your day go? How was last week? Probably we ended up on a conversation from your last appointment. I picked the conversation up from there. If there is any problem, I ask you about it. We start talking about the problem before. So you even forget about your haircut as a point. Yeah. Then go through the whole process. And I'm that type who don't care doing two haircuts a day. If it has to take me 12 hours to do two haircuts for the haircut to look clean, I don't mind. Yeah. Because I believe in quality. And I believe that every haircut that I do, the person has to go, come back. And even when they go, others have to see and are testify to the fact that the haircut is good. Yeah. So you see all these things you go through when you are done with the haircut. You see people singing your praises. praises. Mm -hmm. They go, thank you so much. Yeah. Ah, oh my God. Yeah. You have done so well. I actually have people who tell me that, no, I wonder how I'm going to get a haircut if you are no more, excuse me, to say if you travel. Mm. So the feeling is just different. And aside that, these people actually pay you again. Yeah. So apart, aside putting smiles on people's faces, you're also making some good money. 
Yeah. And the point where I get into my bed and feel happy is what? After the whole day, you accumulate all these accolades. Yeah. And you go and sit in your bed. I'm like, ah, 25 people are happy because of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can imagine that joy. Yeah, I I do. I, I mean, I understand it very well. It's, it's a good I've... feeling. It is, it is a good feeling. And, and it's, it's, it's a very easy lifestyle. Like, yeah. it gives you freedom yeah. of even your dressing. Yeah. How to go. like it has no restriction when yeah. it comes to your way of dressing, how you even go about doing your work. Yeah. It's, it's a very nice job. Yeah. I think if you're watching and you feel like there's nothing to do, to try and learn how to maybe hair styling or something. It's fun. Yeah. Because um obviously every work it can be very challenging. But one thing that keeps people going is like the motivation behind it. You know, you need to have passion for what you do. You know. Um so now you see back in the days how the barbering industry were when i'm talking about our forefathers our, our fathers you know when they were cutting hair started from the days you know what i remember was the, when they were using the um just the comb and uh, the blade yeah. you know and looking at now people like you changed the, the whole narrative you know of the barbering industry where you have brands where we, you know, you invest into into yourself and also into your or into your business. Um, looking at how the barbering industry has been evolving, how do you see the barbering industry like ten years to come? In like fifteen, in terms of like technology wise, because now before they were using like um comb and scissors, now you've got machines. Now you've even got like cordless machines. You know, you've got brands and. You know, a whole lot into it now. How do you see it in, in the next few years to come? Do you do you get worried? Now we've got AI, you know. Sometimes I'm 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 I mean I sit down and I'm thinking a lot, a lot, you know, silly things goes in my head sometimes and I think it, oh, would it be a time where, you know, you enter a barbershop and there'll be like um like a robot cutting your hair? Do you think about these things? Do you get worried? Or you 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 think that's that's a good thing, you know, because the barbering industry is evolving, is you know very well. How do you see it in the, in the next five or ten years? I think, um, um, in actual facts, when you look at the history of barbering, right? Yeah, it started from three hundred years back BC in Egypt. Yeah, where barbering was actually performed by um, sharpening flints, and what do you call it? Sharpening flings and then stones. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this barbering was performed by priests. They were performed oh, by... Really? Yes. Those days, to get a haircut, for example, in um, Rome, mm -hmm. to get a haircut, it was for, let's say, warriors who were ready for work, for ready for war. Okay. That's how, sometimes, even before you get a haircut, it's like a puberty right for the male child. Okay. Your transition from childhood to adulthood ushers you to have a haircut. So the growth has been very consistent from Egypt. It moved out from Egypt to Rome, to Greece. Then it went out to America. And Americans now turned it into a whole business ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. You get this. Mm -hmm. So there has been growth. So think about the people, the priests. And barbers were physicians. In those days, you don't just walk into a barber shop. You go to the barber shop when you have, you are sick. Mm -hmm. Babas were performing surgeries. We used to call them Baba surgeons. The name Baba, Babren, yeah. used to be Baba surgeons. Mm -hmm. It was a, a point where, I got to a point where Babas and surgeons part away because there were these warships that needed a surgeon on the war. So the, the, the job or the uh, demand for S uh, surgeons and then doctors became so high so he, they had to separate themselves from barbers and barbers went away so basically barbering has actually evolved yeah and human beings have actually evolved with the barbering as it's it kept the, the craft kept changing so what is the future of it now it is very beautiful uh -huh. those days clippers right it moved from comb um, clip um, blade over comb right then it came to Manual clipper where you have you hold it, yeah. The blade that we're going, yeah. It has a, it was a manual one. You have to. Is it, is it, is it, was that the scissors? No, it's not even or a scissors. It, it looks it looks like a scissors, right? Yeah. But it has this cutting and then guarding blade 
just like the way the machine blade looks, right? Yeah. But you don't need a motor to run it. You need manpower to, All right. to be yeah, yeah, yeah. running it, right? Yeah, yeah, In, yeah. From there to corded clippers. Now we are cutting the cords. Yeah. No more cords. Yeah. What happens is that there are still people who are used to the old cords clippers. Yeah. Corded clippers. Yeah. Cutting it. The thing is that it is very difficult to move around. Okay. So if technology is changing and you are not changing accordingly, yeah. you'll be left behind. Yes, of course. If there are supposed to be AIs mm -hmm. to be doing haircuts, like robots to be doing haircuts, what happens to the human experience? Because you know that barbering is, it actually deals with human beings. Yeah. And people don't only go for haircuts. That you should know. Mm. There are people, the barber shop used to be a place for social gatherings not even used to be it is yeah. a place of social gathering yeah. where people go and talk about their personal issues yeah they see whatever happens in the barber shop stays in the barber shop yeah people come and talk about their wives yeah. come and talk about politics come yeah. and talk about music there are people who come to the barber shop especially reflect not to get a haircut that's yeah. how they experience but it's, it's not it's not a gossip place <laughs> it's actually a gossip that's what that's what it's actually a gossip place yeah Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so there are people who come to have the experience. Yeah. So ask the question: Can AIs or robots give you that experience? So we actually need some human factor, no matter how the technology goes. And even these days, they are they are they are manufacturing clippers that can even allow you to self cut your hair. Oh really? Yes, but it is a skill. It is a skill, especially drawing your hairline and all that. And you you know that human. Human hair lines, hair lines are not one with it. Yeah. Everybody in their head shape. Yeah. I mean, technology can work on that, but there's still human factor has to come in and people need to change accordingly how, as to how technology is changing. So what strategies have you used to grow your business and reach your target audience? So personally, as social media, one social media because this is the age of social media and then online marketing you cannot do with it this is we used to do the regular marketing where you meet people you talk about your baba shop and you 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 you, you actually set up in a busy place where people can actually see you and come yeah. but social media and then online marketing has been my number one strategy and also focusing on quality giving out the best if i get two i'm okay i'm making sure that i maintain and keep these two yeah. and our job grows on recommendations yeah. especially our jobs like my brain goes on recommendation so the thing is that if you are not able to impress a client sitting in your chair right it becomes difficult for you to grow because this this um, person goes out of your chair and goes to spread the bad news about you. If you yeah. do, if you do him well, he goes and tells good news about you. And you have a handful of people you are nurturing, a whole family you are creating, a whole society of clients you are creating, and it helps you grow. So social media and giving the quality, being professional, yeah. and giving an experience, it's one of the main strategies. It's very important. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what advice would you give to someone considering a career in barbering or Starting their own barber shop. I mean, consistency. Show up every time. If you are a, if you are a barber, if you are, if you're somebody who if you are somebody who is considering on becoming a barber, right? Just have it in mind that at the early stages, you need to come in early and closely. When everybody sees have close, stay in to save. Yeah, because that's how you grow your clientele, and also. Also, learn to invest in your craft, right? Investing in yourself means investing in your tools, investing in, um, how do you call it? Learning more skills. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. I used to be just a barber. I didn't know how to do styling. Now, I had to study how to do microblading. I had to study how to do pixie cuts. I had to study how to do like professional like hair styling so basically you go to the barber shop they give you the haircut and go but barbering is actually a an act of grooming styling right yeah. and dressing 
hey, yeah, before even cutting comes, mm. right? Yeah, cutting is the ultimate. But after cutting, most barbers believe this story. Oh, because they feel like, oh, I'm done giving your hairline. But how the hair feels, the texture, yeah, the look of it also comes to play. So basically, you have to focus on all these four arms of barbering yeah. and make sure you hit it right. Yeah, and basically, you have to also at the point transform yourself from an individual barber to training people that will form a team you know, that helps you grow a business. Don't be a barber. Be a business owner, a barbershop business owner. And that's how you gain that rushing to grow. Talking about business owners, how would you like to describe yourself as an entrepreneur or as a barber? First of all, I was a barber before I became an entrepreneur. I'm a barber, I'm an entrepreneur, and then I'm an inspirational speaker. Yeah. Somebody who, I'm a sage. Yeah. I'm who tries to lead people on. Yeah. I'm that guy who will tell you that, actually, do it, do it, do it. Yeah. If I see something right, I don't hide it. I like to t- tell you about it. Yeah. So I'm an entrepreneur, a barber. I can, I'm a colorist. I can say I'm an activist. Yeah. Right? And then I inspire people to do what? I think you should look more into inspired people because you speak very, very well. <laughs> I always got get that a lot. Yes. Yeah. There is this man, Mr. Liman. He always tells me that you... I can see your future. You're yeah. going to become a pastor or an inspirational speaker. Yeah. I don't know where he sees the pastor from. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I'm not too sure about the pastor, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's an honor to have you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And so I'm much. sure a lot of people learn a lot from, you know, our conversation. Um, So thank you for coming. All right. But before I leave, I would want to, um, let people know where to find me yeah yeah so um on instagram my personal page is degree baba degree baba is just one word so degree yeah. baba degree baba then when you want to follow the reflect page one of the best selling uh, unisex salons salons in accra yet hoping to go internationally so reflect dot ghana on facebook instagram tiktok everywhere just follow us and like our jobs if you in case you need any assistance in barbering, your hair styling, tips and all that, you can always reach out. So do you do weddings, you know, all that? Yes, I actually have a wedding. I'll okay. the wedding next month. Yeah. I may even be traveling to Nigeria soon to okay. cover a wedding. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that we got different uh, other branches, so you go just... Yeah, so there is... Uh, okay, so for location, we're at Ashalibuchi. Yeah. Reflect Ghana Ashalibuchi on the map. We have two branches, one at Adenta and Ashalibuchi. So anytime you type reflect, Depending on where you want to go, you add the area code, mm-hmm. Ashali Butri or Adenda, and it takes you there. But mind you, book an appointment before you come. It's always appointment. Yes. yes, because it prepares us for you before you come, and yeah. it's always an easy go. Yeah. You walk in, you say, to get your haircut. No long queues. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, you fed it from the horses on map. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching, and then I'll see you soon. Bye.